is a rocket tank. It may not seem like much now, but it's actually designed to do some pretty incredible things. It's just a demonstrator, but it's going to hold about 40 liters of liquid and be able to withstand up to 110 bars of pressure. And this is the technology that we're going to use in order to push our rocket transcendence all the way to space. And here's the crazy thing. We were able to build this for just under 500 euros. I'll take the deal! So let's talk a little bit about how we were able to put this all together and how it leads up to our first major test for the structure system, which is the pressure test. Our tank can basically be broken down into three different pieces. First, we have the tube, which is made out of carbon fiber. We picked carbon fiber because it is super strong for its weight and it actually saves us a lot of mass for the overall vehicle. In order to make the carbon fiber tube, we actually need to use a carbon fiber winding machine because of course, carbon fibers aren't exactly rigid structures that we can just like cut into the shape we want. So we kind of have to wrap them as you would like a fabric or something like that. The next parts of the tank are the two bulkheads, which will enclose the tube and form the tank structure. These are specially custom designed aluminum parts with lots of interesting features all over them. The main job of these aluminum bulkheads is to of course connect with the CFRP tube in a way that is strong enough that it can keep the pressure, while also providing some sort of a uh, interface with the valves and the connections that we're making in order to make this a proper tank in the end. And that leads into the third part of the tanks, which is actually all of those valves and connections. And that's it! That's our tank! The first step is to build that carbon fiber tube. If you follow this channel, then you'll remember that a couple months back we did some widening trials with some smaller sized tubes, but now it's time to step up to the full 250 millimeter diameter. You're playing with the big boys now. For our first winding trial, we got into the lab and we did all the math to figure out what all the angles for our laying would have to be. Once that was figured out, we basically went right into the winding, which of course starts with mixing up our epoxy and our hardener and preparing the mandrel for starting that winding. At first, everything seemed to be going all right. We were getting a lot of resin onto the tube, but that wasn't such a huge problem that it was causing uh, issues with the winding. And it may have actually been an improvement on some of the previous trials we did because the fibers were going on pretty dry in those cases. So we were still experimenting with how to control the resin onto the, onto the mandrel. But our problems began once that first 90 degree layer was finished because we noticed immediately that there was a bit of a problem with those crisscross layers. It turns out that at the end of each of the passes, the fiber was really slipping across the mandrel because of all the resin that was on the first layer. This was really creating a problem with us maintaining our pattern and was really creating a lot of chaotic behavior. So we needed to do something. We decided to stop the process and think about what we could do to rectify this issue. After some deliberation, the solution that we came to was actually to add a little more time to the end of each of the passes so that the fiber would have time to kind of set itself before we started to go down the next pass. In theory, this should help us to have less tension on the fiber as we were doing each of the crisscross layers and hopefully have less slippage. Unfortunately, we took a little bit too long deliberating and actually once we had figured out our conclusion and how we we're going to proceed, uh, the resin in the resin bath had kind of hardened. <laughs> Which is not ideal because if the resin is hard, uh, it really starts to screw with the fibers and um, it doesn't exactly go into the mandrel properly anymore. And actually, interestingly enough, if the resin gets harder, there's actually more friction on the fiber as it goes onto the mandrel. So in the end, it actually causes there to be more slipping again. So, so we had to kind of stop the whole process again, take out the resin bath, clean it all up, and kind of reset and get started again. Unfortunately, this meant we had to actually cut the carbon fiber in order to do this. So it's not really a continuous fiber on this tank, unfortunately. But after that, once we had got the resin bath all sorted out and started the process again, it was mostly smooth sailing. After letting the mandrel sit for a couple of days and then taking the carbon fiber tube off the mandrel, we were finally able to have our finalized part. In the end, it weighed about 2.4 kilograms, was about 57% fiber and 43% resin, which is pretty close to the mixture ratio that we're going for, which is more of a 60-40. So in the end, actually, even though we had all the struggles, it actually turned out to be a pretty good part. Unfortunately, it's not a very smooth part because of the layers that we messed up because of the slipping of the fiber. But in the end, it doesn't really matter, I guess. This part won't fly, so we're not too concerned about that. Oh, no, not again. But regardless, we wanted to do better. So we decided to go back to the lab in order to hopefully wind a slightly better version this time. On the second time around, we decided to modify our strategy slightly because we realized that the first 90 degree layer was kind of 
adding a little bit to the problems with respect to the slipping of the fiber. Basically because you have those 90 degree layers all with resin on it, it kind of makes it a lot more slippery for the, for the fiber. So it creates this situation where the fiber can kind of skate across the surface. So to solve that, we decided why not just start with the crisscross layers and then do the 90 layer on the top. This way <clears throat> we don't have to worry about, you know, having some slipping. And it turned out this strategy was actually pretty good. We were winding the fiber, it was all working great. We had this beautiful crisscross pattern that was coming. Everything seemed to be going fine. Little bit is okay. It is turning, turning out to be very nice. It's like... Okay, well let's, let's not say things before we have results. So we launched into full panic mode, trying to figure out exactly what happened with the mandrel, why it had fallen to the ground, and of course we had to rectify the problem and get this thing rolling again because our resin is hardening and we don't want to have a situation where the bath hardens like it did the last time. So we realized that actually what might have happened is that the mandrel might have rotated the wooden pieces that we have to mount to the chuck, might have rotated it off of the mount and caused it to fall. So we uh, basically readjusted those mounts put them on uh, a bit tighter and a bit more professionally, although we're still just using duct tape, but uh, that's all we had for the time being, so that's what we had to use. So once we had that figured out, we were able to remount it onto the, onto the chuck, but first we had to manually realign the fiber on the pattern that we were winding on. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. Of course, if you mess up the pattern, you could end up in a situation where you have a bunch of fiber in one spot on the tube and almost none on another spot and that will create weak spots in your tube, which could lead to obviously structural failure in the case of pressure being added into the tube. So we wanted to avoid that. So once we had this thing mounted on properly, we were ready to start the winding process again. Uh, we were still hoping that the winding pattern wouldn't be too messed up by what we had done, but uh, let's see if it works out for us. So we decided to start up the process again, but as soon as we had started up, we immediately realized what the real problem was, which is that the carbon fiber was actually getting caught in one of the feeding wheels that was taking the fiber into the resin bath. And basically it was catching on the wheel and causing it to fray and creating a whole bunch of tension and putting that tension onto the mandrel, which is what ripped it off the uh, chuck in the first place. So we had to do some surgery and snip out the bad section and then reattach a piece of fiber from the wheel onto the fiber that's already on the tube by making a knot. And we uh, re-hooked that all up, got it feeding through the resin again, and decided to start the process and just before the resin was about to start hardening. Success! Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Yeah, whenever you go to the lab, sometimes things that you never expect end up happening. Unfortunately, this is just one of those cases, but we were able to recover everything and actually get the fiber rolling again. We also managed to recover our pattern somewhat. We had some double layers for a little bit, but after that the pattern filled out fine and we ended up in a situation where there weren't any gaps. So in the end, I guess it was okay. But it seems like we just can't get that perfect part. Maybe our perfectionist feelings will get the better of us and we'll try to come in for a third time. But for now, we don't have time for that. So it's on to the next step. You can see how these bulkheads are kind of working. So we have the one side which is providing the tank surface on the inside. And then on the sides here, in the pockets, we have basically these holes. And that's where we're going to plug in our valves and our sensors. And then of course the holes on the side here are for screwing the actual CFRP to the bulkhead. And yeah, when you put it all together, basically this whole piece will be covered with the CFRP and you'll only see the pockets where we put the valves in. And this one over here is actually, this is for the upper part of it. And this is only like five or six kilograms. So this is why we like to make rockets out of aluminum because it's actually quite light for the strength of the material. Of course, it's great to have a carbon fiber tube, but if you don't have a way to attach it to your bulkheads, 
it's not going to make a very effective tank. So we actually came up with a way in which we're going to use screws in order to attach the carbon fiber to the aluminum. But there's one problem, I guess, with that, which is that carbon fiber doesn't really work well with drilling. Because of the nature of carbon fiber, it's a fibrous material, of course, um, and when you try to drill it, the fibers kind of are going to break, naturally, and they don't really break very cleanly if you just use a regular drill. So we uh, recognized this at the start and decided, well, why don't we try to do a little experimentation and see how bad carbon fiber drilling really is? Because we were hearing a bunch of stories from people and, you know, you hear one thing, you hear another thing. In the end, you just have to try it and do it yourself. See what happens. So we decided to take one of our practice parts and just drill some holes and see how they came out. And we're happy to report that drilling into carbon fiber is actually possible, of course, uh, but maybe not the best to do with just a regular metal drill. As you can see here, there was a lot of fraying and inconsistent breakage in terms of how the drill went through the part. So maybe not the most secure connection that we're making. And potentially we're doing a lot of damage to the actual structure of the piece. But of course that will be verified and determined in the pressure test. Nonetheless, we'll be reporting on that and let you know if uh, this is actually working well or not. Not a great plan. But there's actually one other strategy that we decided to implement for drilling into the carbon fiber, which is why not try to select a drill bit which is more designed for cutting through fibers. It turns out that there's a fibrous material that we drill through all the time. Uh, wood! So we thought, why not just use a wood drill bit in order to go through the carbon fiber? So once again, we tried to experiment with this by taking one of our practice parts and trying to drill it with a wood drill bit. And it turns out, it actually works pretty well! It makes a nice clean hole without any fraying and actually does a pretty good job. The reason for this is actually pretty simple because a metal drill bit actually cuts from the center and kind of has this like taper to it. So it's always cutting the material, it's like boring the material out like, you know, a tunneling machine would. But a wood drill is a little bit different in that it doesn't actually bore, it kind of cuts from the sides. Basically a wood drill bit works by cutting from the edges instead of cutting from the middle and that basically does a lot better for cutting the fibers uh, succinctly and not creating a problem when it comes to just ripping them apart like the metal build, drill bit does. So if you're looking to drill your carbon fiber, this is potentially a really good option. But before we started drilling the carbon fiber for real, we needed to have a strategy for how we were actually going to drill those holes and make sure that they were precise. Um, so basically we fit this aluminum piece over top of the carbon fiber and it will hold the carbon fiber in place while we drill. Uh, the holes into the CFRP tube and theoretically it should give us a super accurate uh, hole uh, uh, position for all of the holes in the CFRP and the CFRP uh, tube should fit exactly over the bulkheads and the holes should align up exactly. Um, I know this is a problem with a lot of amateur rockets is getting these holes to line up exactly so this is the strategy that we're going to use to make this happen so we'll see if it works. <laughs> Hopefully it works better than the other things we've tried to do. <laughs> design in the past because uh, our success rate is not so great. Once we had our drilling mount ready to go, it was time to drill some holes. So, special secret here. Um, we actually only drilled 88 holes. We are missing two. <laughs> but we have over-engineered it quite a lot, so we probably will just not put it back on the, uh, on the drill mount because that would just be complete hell. <laughs> so the time has finally come to put these pieces together. But because all the parts are pretty tight fitting, it actually takes a lot of effort to actually manually push the pieces together. So unless you're Hercules, we're going to need a slightly better method of doing this. The way this works is basically we're going to put the tube on top, and then we're going to take this guy, we're going to put it on top of this one. So it'll be, you know, that. It's all even, so that when we take these nuts, and we start to screw them, it'll slowly push this on. And then this will basically be forced in inside. So like these rods have tension and we are applying a compressive force. 
So then it was just a matter of slowly winching the bulkheads into the tube itself. And the reason why we want to do it this way is because we can control the orientation of the bulkhead as it goes into the tube and we can make sure that the screw holes are lining up with the holes in the CFRP, which is obviously very important. In the end, we're able to get everything lined up and finally, we were able to start putting in some of the screws. But this wasn't the end. We actually wanted to do a little bit of a leak test to make sure that the tube was actually watertight. The tank full of water. What happens if, what has the tank full of water? Have you seen that advertisement where they will just slap the duct tape onto the hole of water? Can you see that? I'm putting, is there uh, any? From the holes it is coming. Is it? Coming? A little bit. Which holes? From the bottom now to the because there are some bubbles. So unfortunately it looks like our tank is not quite watertight right now. And the reason for this is that we didn't have the right seals. You notice that during the assembly we put those two black rubber seals into the seal grooves of the bulkheads. Well, it turns out that the seals that we had were three millimeters thick and those grooves were also three millimeters. Luckily we have some new seals that are on the way and they have a thickness of 3.55 millimeters. So they should perfectly be able to fulfill that job of providing some friction that will seal off the tank wall from the aluminum bulkhead. With that final piece in place, we'll finally be ready to test out this tank at the end of October with our pressure test. And just to remind you, we're going to be pushing that tank all the way up to 110 bar, which is going to get pretty crazy. So you don't miss out on any of the action, be sure to subscribe. And remember to expand your horizons.